Excellent. All right, everybody. So it's my pleasure to be here with you today and to tell you a little bit about some of the things that really excite us over in the chemical engineering department and other departments here at Stanford. As you can see from the title of the talk, the theme is developing a sustainable pathway to fuels and chemicals. So I'd like to start off the uh, experience here with a question. It's a pretty simple yes, no question. And by a show of hands, raise your hands if you like renewable energy. If you like renewable energy, raise your hand. If you don't like renewable energy, keep your hand down. Okay, so this is pretty good. So, you know, over 90% of incoming uh, graduate students at Stanford University like renewable energy. That's great. I'll keep that statistic in mind. All right, next question. Uh, same question, but do you like fossil fuels? Raise your hand if you like fossil fuels. Keep your hands down if you don't like fossil fuels. Okay, so it's, uh, I don't know, maybe 40% of incoming graduate students at Stanford University like fossil fuels. This is where I want to start my talk today, is talking about fossil fuels, because it is, in fact, how our world works today. And I'd like to use this as an example. Let's take a look at petroleum, okay? And you can think of gasoline when we're going through the slide. The first thing I'd want to point out is that gasoline, you know, maybe you're concerned about it running out or petroleum running out or if and when that will happen. Whether it does, whether it doesn't, we have to recognize it currently provides about five terawatts of the 17 total terawatts that we human beings are consuming across the globe. Okay, this is a massive, massive resource, so it's extraordinarily abundant. It's also got a tremendous energy density. If you think about it, you can drive a car about 500 miles on just one tank of gas. And this is not, not, no supercar. This is like a, you know, a Toyota Camry. Okay? It can drive you easily from here to Los Angeles and maybe all the way to San Diego on one tank of gas. All right? Or you can fly a commercial jet halfway around the earth. Many of you probably took one of these jets to be here today. Uh, it's, it also, I mean, if you want to think about it, if you want to think about just a one tank of gasoline in a car, it's approximately equivalent to the potential energy of one million gallons of water 200 feet above our a million gallons of water crashing down from 200 feet up. Okay, that energy is the energy in just one standard tank of gasoline. Or the electrical energy stored in 80,000 iPhone 6 batteries, okay, which is pretty much close to the population of San Francisco. So imagine everybody in San Francisco has an iPhone, which is not probably too far from reality. Add up all those iPhones into one massive pile, and that's just one Toyota Camry's worth of, of gasoline. Okay? But it's not just got this, it doesn't just have this huge energy density, it has a tremendous power density. It can power just about anything we want. It could be a ship across the Pacific, it could be a jet, it could be a car, it could be a truck, military aircraft. Uh, the power transfer and filling up your car at the pump, okay? You're just standing there, you just fill. Raise your hand if you've ever filled up a, a gas tank of a, of a car. You stood there, you filled up with gas, uh-huh. That was five megawatts going through your fingers there, okay? If you convert that energy, that intrinsic energy into electricity units, and five megawatts, just to put it into a scale that we can maybe think of a little bit better, uh, if you had a nuclear power plant, okay, a nuclear powered plant, that's about one gigawatt is your typical size of a nuclear power plant. Okay, one gigawatt is 200 times this number. So if you have 200 people just filling up their gas tank, falling asleep uh, as they do this, that's equivalent to the entire output of a nuclear power plant. Okay, that's how much power transfer is going through your finger trips. Yet, despite the high energy, the high power density, it's extremely chemically stable. I mean, when you jump in a car, do you worry that it's going to blow up on you? They're like, I'm driving a bomb. Right? You ever worried about that? I mean, it's true. It's a bomb. It's completely combustible. But we don't worry about that. It's, it's actually quite safe. We've engineered the appropriate controls. It's easy to store and transport. It's over 100,000 miles. 100,000 miles of gasoline pipeline in the USA. Right? I mean, if you drive across the country, anyone drive across the country to be here this week? Yeah, a few of you. How many miles is it? Yeah, about 3,000 miles, right? So you got 100,000 miles of gasoline pipeline. And as a liquid fuel, it can fit into any container that we want. Actually, let's talk about cost for a second. Let me uh, go back. Uh, let's do another show of hands. Gasoline, is it expensive, is it cheap, or is it about right? The price of gasoline these days is, is what? What's the cost of gas? So, so it, quantitatively here in California, about $3 a gallon. So show of hands, raise your hand if you think it's expensive. Okay, a few of you, raise your hand if you think it's cheap. Raise your hand if you think it's about right. Okay, yeah, I think it's cheap. I mean, two to three bucks a gallon. I mean, let's compare it with some other goods. Uh, bottled water, about a buck a gallon. Milk, about three bucks a gallon, right? Orange juice, a half gallon probably costs you two or three dollars, right? So a full gallon is probably five bucks for a full gallon of orange juice. 
So I mean, I'd say for the value, I'd much rather have a gallon of gasoline gets me from here to, to San Francisco versus a gallon of milk or a gallon of orange juice for that matter. I think it's pretty valuable stuff. And there's convenience. Has anyone done this before? Has anyone ever timed themselves at the pump? You get there, a lot of you have pumped gas before into a car. Have you ever looked at your watch and like, oh, I wonder how long this takes? Yeah, how long does it take? Three and a half minutes, it must have been a big tank. It usually takes me less than three minutes. It's six gallons a minute is your typical flow rate. Six gallons a minute, a typical car has 15 to 18 gallons of gas. You can do the math, it's like two and a half minutes, typically maybe three minutes, if it's completely empty. I encourage you to time yourself. You can go from a completely empty gas tank, three minutes later, with a family of four and all their luggage, drive from here to Los Angeles in three minutes. If your cell phone is out of battery and you're at an airport and you plug it in for three minutes and then you gotta run, what does that give you, <laughs> right? You're lucky if you can boot up your phone, right, in those three minutes. So the point I'm making with this slide is that energy future energy technology needs to compete with these attributes. It's as simple as that. I love renewable energy. I also like fossil fuels because this is what it allows us to do. We're all here because of it. So I like them both a ton, but I really want to enable renewable energy to enter the field, right? To enter the game. And to do that well, you just need to, if you, can, if you can't compete with this, it's going to be tough to ask people to switch. And that really brings us to the theme of what I want to talk about today is this, the renewable production of fuels and chemicals, okay? Where we don't have to rely so entirely on fossil feedstocks. So here's the engineering approach. You got a black box. No idea what's inside that black box. You just know you want to feed into it three things. Three things that we have in abundance. We got sunlight, we got water, we got CO2 in the atmosphere, we all know that. You flow those three things in and you're gonna ask your black box to break up some bonds and form some new bonds. So you have one output of O2, which we can all breathe and enjoy. And the other stream is this list of very important chemicals. These are all chemicals that we're using on a massive scale across the globe today. We've got hydrogen, carbon monoxide, we got alcohols, we got hydrocarbons, plenty of others. Most of this stuff comes from fossil fuels. But what if we could make these same types of molecules not from fossils, but make it from renewable resources like sunlight and water? And, and we all know there's lots of CO2 in the atmosphere to go around. If you could do such a thing, you could use any of these molecules as fuels themselves, or they could be chemical products that the chemical industry would normally produce, or chemical precursors that then go into a different process to then make the molecule that you want. So the whole point is, can we shift the paradigm from away from fossil fuels to renewable fuels or sustainable fuels, okay? So that's the premise. Now, what's inside that black box? What's inside this thing? Catalysts. You're gonna need catalysts for sure. You're gonna need lots of things. And there's actually many different schemes. In fact, there are some schemes that technically don't even require catalysts, to be honest with you. But uh, just to whet your appetite, you can imagine if you're in biology, right? You could engineer organisms that could grab sunlight and CO2 and water and, and make the fuels that you want. Or if you're thinking more along the lines of a chemist, you can imagine designing molecules that could do that type of a process. Uh, if you're into uh, more mechanical engineering type stuff, uh, material science type stuff, you can imagine uh, you know, designing these mirrors and heating up a spot really hot to, to do these chemical transformations. Uh, making photovoltaics or wind turbines and coupling them to water electrolyzers, okay? Other electrochemical technologies. There's lots of different schemes. This is just to whet your appetite. Frankly, what's inside that black box is completely limited by only one thing, and that is our own creativity and our own imagination. Just don't break the second law of thermodynamics. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about today are two separate schemes. These are known as electrochemical and photoelectrochemical pathways to do the these chemical conversions that I'm describing. So you can grab your conventional solar cell or wind turbine and plug it into a device that grabs water and splits it into hydrogen and oxygen, or you can flow in CO2 as well and then make carbon-based products, fuels and chemicals, right? If you make a fuel like gasoline, you can just combust it just like we normally would. Out comes the CO2, you feed it right back into the process and you just recycle that CO2. There's no net emission. Or you can take that CO2 and make a chemical like ethylene, which can then, you can make polyethylene, which goes into a milk jug, and now you've made that solidified form of CO2 as a milk jug. From there to the end of its life, it's gonna just get recycled as a solid. So that CO2 is actually a CO2 negative technology. You can do that with two separate devices, or you can kind of combine this photovoltaic type panel 
with the catalyst that you would use in here, and then you shine light with this panel underwater and do all these chemical transformations, okay? Making methanol or hydrogen or ethylene or whatever it is that you want. So the point here is that uh, these are just two of the many possible schemes which I wanna talk about today, but either way you go, you're going to need good catalysts. If you don't have catalysts that are efficient and selective to make the products that you want and are stable, if you don't have these characteristics, it's just gonna be a no-go. You'll, you'll never be able to compete with fossil fuels. All right, so if you made these technologies, how does it fit? I think it fits quite snugly within the way we already use energy globally. So you can imagine, this is a scheme with a lot, this is a, called a, a process flow diagram in chemical engineering. You got all these molecules going from one place to the other or electrons going from one place to the other. At the heart and soul of this diagram are these types of technologies I was showing you on the previous slide. You wanna convert water, CO2, maybe convert methane, convert nitrogen into value added products, okay? Nitrogen, you can electrochemically produce ammonia. Ammonia is the component in fertilizer that feeds people. Right, you can grab natural gas, you can convert that into methanol, for instance, and from methanol you can go to a whole bunch of different chemical products or fuels. And of course, water and CO2 that we've already talked about. So where are you gonna get that electricity? Well, you wanna get it from someplace renewable, right? Like hydropower, or wind turbines, or solar cells. Okay, that goes into these types of cells to, to make the products you want. So you make, let's say, hydrogen. Well then that hydrogen, where are you gonna use that hydrogen? Well, you can use that as a fuel itself, for sure, or you can add that hydrogen to carbon dioxide that came from a power plant, okay? You burn, say, biomass in a power plant, you release CO2, you can hydrogenate that CO2 to then make the chemicals and fuels that you want, and you've got a renewable source of H2. Okay, so there's, I don't wanna go through this in, in all the detail that it has, but just to give you a sense, the idea isn't com to like completely get away from the technologies that already exist at a global scale, but rather to use these technologies and couple with them in intelligent ways so that we can get a more sustainable, renewable pathway to doing all the things that we normally do. So in our lab to this end, one thing that we work on quite a bit is on electrocatalysts that can utilize this electricity to convert protons from water into hydrogen or stick them onto CO2 to make carbon-based fuels and chemicals. We also wanna oxidize water so we can release the protons and electrons needed for these reactions. If you read them left to right, that's fuel production. But we also wanna make catalysts for fuel consumption because if you have a car and you wanna run it on a fuel, a fuel cell, for instance, could be a much more efficient way of utilizing that chemical energy than an internal combustion engine. So we work on catalysts that go right to left as well. In the fuel production direction, once we make these catalysts, what do we do with them? We wanna integrate them into devices. So we integrate them into devices like, like fuel cells or regenerative fuel cells or water electrolyzers, which I'll talk about in a bit or solar photoelectrodes. Again, in putting these types of catalysts that make hydrogen, putting them onto photovoltaic type materials, we can just dunk the whole thing under water, shine light, and make the products that we want. Also, my group has been working in thermal catalysis recently. So it, you can take, say, that renewable hydrogen that we're making in these types of devices, and then put them into the conventional technology that the chemical industry already uses to upgrade carbon monoxide or CO2 into molecules like ethanol or methanol that are very important for our, our entire chemical industry. So what I wanna to talk to you about today is, uh, I wanna talk about catalysis, talk about making hydrogen, and then how do we develop catalysts for this, how do we integrate them into devices, and then I wanna, I'll conclude with just a few thoughts on how we do this reaction CO2. All right, so let's say you wanna make hydrogen inexpensively. You want a non-precious metal catalyst to do the trick. Well, let me say a, a few words about how you even do this reaction, how do you study this reaction. Here's the reaction here. Okay, we use these electrochemical cells. I won't dive into the details. But you wanna run this reaction of taking protons and electrons and making H2. And I'm gonna be showing you some data just to be pedagogic for a moment. Well, how we normally look at this type of information is on a current voltage curve. Okay, zero is a very important value on the x-axis. If, if your electrode is positively charged with relevance to zero, with reference to zero, then you, you actually favor the oxidation of hydrogen to make protons. If you actually wanna make hydrogen, then you wanna tilt your electrode to the negative side of zero. And the amount of current that you get out is telling you how fast that reaction is running. So that's what it lo the data looks like schematically in real life. Here's again, current versus voltage. Here's with no catalyst, it's totally flat. You don't get any current out of the deal. It means no, no reaction happening. In this case, when you, we do put a catalyst for the hydrogen evolution reaction, then you can see that you get this big negative current and the goal is to make catalysts where this is closer and closer to zero. Because zero is what's known as the equilibrium potential. You hold your electrode at zero, 
the forward and backward reaction are exactly the same rate, and so you get zero product. All right. So if you want to make a catalyst, you want to know how does this reaction even proceed? And I've got interesting news. We've been looking at this catalyst uh, process for over 200 years as a scientific community, and we still have absolutely no idea how it works, even on the most well-defined surfaces. And this is about as simple as an electrochemical reaction can get. So let's take a look at some of the basics. How, did, how might it happen? There's really two competing mechanisms, one called the Volmer-Tafel mechanism, one called the Volmer-Hirovsky. The Volmer-Tafel mechanism starts with a proton in solution landing on the surface, making an adsorbed hydrogen add atom. The second proton comes down on a different site. Now you've got two of these H's. They come together, form a molecular bond, and take off, voila, you've made your H2. This process starts exactly the same way with this Volmer step. Okay, the, hydrogen, the proton comes down, you make adsorbed hydrogen add atom. And now this one, instead of finding an empty site, it lands right on top of the first one, gets an electron, and now you make the H2 bond and it takes off. We have no idea which is the one that actually happens in real life. We don't. However, there's an interesting point that either way you go, you have exactly the same reactive intermediate sitting on the surface. It's an adsorbed hydrogen atom sitting on there. So you might think, well, hey, if I want to make a good catalyst, I want to make a catalyst that binds this hydrogen not too strongly and not too weakly to let this reaction to proceed. And if, you, if that thought occurred to you, uh, congratulations, that thought occurred to Roger Parsons over 50 years ago as he was doing paper and pencil theory, okay, and basically showed this is an activity plot. And he says that if you look at this hydrogen atom sitting on the surface, the delta G of that hydrogen sticking on there, the best catalyst is at the peak here where that delta G is close to zero. Not too strong, not too weak. So that really helped formulate, you know, conceptually what the problem is. But the issue at this time was that, well, what's the, you know, how do you know what the delta G is for this process? And it would actually take more time to figure that out than just measuring the thing for hydrogen in the first place. But now you advance 50 plus years, and now we can use computers to do that. So with density functional theory, we can actually calculate that delta G of hydrogen adsorption. And you can see that this is all experimental data on the y-axis plotted versus calculated values on the x-axis, and you get exactly this volcano-type relationship. So it gives you a sense that we understand what the problems are in this reaction. The big issue is if you look up here at all the best catalysts, they're all platinum, palladium, very expensive precious metals. So how do you get around that? So here's some work from about 11 years ago. Jens Norsko at the time was at the Technical University of Denmark, and he's now here at Stanford in the Chemical Engineering Department. We worked together quite a bit, to say the least. And he and a postdoc were looking into enzymes that are effective at making hydrogen. These enzymes, Mother Nature doesn't use precious metals for these processes. Mother Nature found a way to be a great catalyst with no precious metals at all. And long story short, they had, they had used these calculations to suggest that certain types of materials that contain no precious metals might work similarly. And indeed, when I was a postdoc working in Denmark, we were able to synthesize some of these types of nanocatalysts and showed that, in fact, they were very effective. These are molybdenum sulfide materials. They were very effective for hydrogen. And when I started my group here at Stanford eight years ago, we started cranking out all kinds of different high surface area catalysts of molybdenum sulfides with lots of edge sites, which is where all the action takes place. So nanowires and nanoporous materials and small molecules. Basically, lots of edge sites means high activity. And you can see from this current versus voltage plot that we're just marching our way from left to right, getting closer and closer to zero. Now, once we started making these types of catalysts, we asked ourselves, well, you know, what do we want to do with them? And so the answer is, well, start integrating these onto semiconductors for direct solar photoelectrochemical water splitting. And so my student, Jesse, basically went to the clean room here at Stanford and started making himself a PN junction solar cell of silicon, then layered a little bit of molybdenum and made a molybdenum sulfide on top. So this is what it looks like from a cross-section uh, transmission electron microscopy image. We can zoom in a little bit. Oops. And what you see here is this really thin layer of MOS2, looks kind of like graphite, sitting on top of ultimately a silicon wafer, PN junction solar cell. So we take this material, we encapsulate it in, in epoxy, and we dunk it under water, not just water, sulfuric acid, 0.5 molar, shine light onto it, and we saw what happened. The thing evolved hydrogen beautifully. And in fact, again, here's another current versus voltage curve. All the curves I was showing you before were on the left because I told you thermodynamically you need to be on the left side of zero to, to make hydrogen from water if you put in electricity. But if you shine light onto the system, 
the silicon is exciting those electrons to a higher state. So now you can actually evolve hydrogen, that's what this current means, to the right of zero. And in fact, here we're getting our 10 milliamps per square centimeter at about positive 0.16 volts versus, versus zero on this scale. An undergraduate in our lab, Kara Fong, then did a measurement and showed that 100% of those electrons are actually going to hydrogen. So we don't have any corrosion going on, no funny business. We have just purely selective H2 coming out of our cell. We also did a stability measurement. We found that after 100 hours of illumination, even though this is only about two to three nanometers of MOS2, that was able to protect this thing in sulfuric acid. Silicon does not want to be hanging out in sulfuric acid. It would die very rapidly without any protection. The only thing is that we noticed that there weren't a lot of edge sites on this surface. And as I mentioned earlier, the edge sites of this molysulfide is what's causing the catalysis. So then a postdoc in my group, Jakob, who had developed these MO3 S13 clusters, which have lots and lots of edge sites, he literally just spray painted them down onto the surface of this uh, system I was showing you just now. And when you do that, you're able to move that even further to the right, the current voltage curve. Now we're getting these 10 milliamps per square centimeter at positive 0.27 volts versus zero. So that's just some concept of how you can develop a catalyst, no precious metals, it works well. You put it on a semiconductor to do a direct photo process, but we can also make electrolyzers, these types of devices that you just plug into a solar cell directly. So this is work from my student Desmond who, who created these types of contraptions. And you know, he basically takes the same catalyst that I was just describing before, makes this membrane electrode assembly, assembles it into the device. And when he makes these catalysts, he makes, he makes nanoparticles of all these things. Here's our voltage current plot now inverted a little bit where you want to get as much current out of this device as possible with a minimum amount of voltage. And what he's doing is he's showing us these different formulations of molybdenum sulfides that I was showing you earlier and how they compare versus platinum. Frankly, they're not as good as platinum, but they're pretty darn close. They're off by about 150 millivolts, maybe 200 millivolts. But remember, molybdenum sulfide is effectively a completely free and scalable abundant material versus platinum, which is not. So there's a big advantage to going to non-precious metals. What about the electrochemical conversion of CO2 to fuels and chemicals? Let's get off of hydrogen for a second, and I'll wrap up in one minute. And I just want to say that you know, this is, these are really hard reactions if you want to go from CO2 to, say, methane or ethylene or, or alcohols. Okay? And, the, and thermodynamically, it turns out to be about the same difficulty, but the kinetics are such that if you want CO2 to come in and you're hitting it with all these protons and all these electrons to make something like methane, there are an awful lot of steps in this reaction to make it go. And all these steps means there's no such thing as a good catalyst right now. So that's what we're working on. Much more complicated than hydrogen evolution. We're trying to make catalysts that are just as good as the ones we made for hydrogen, but that can attack CO2. The last thing I'll say on it is, and I'll thank my three students here, Kendra, Natasha, and David. You probably heard from Natasha earlier this morning. These are my first three students to work on this project. One of the first things that they found when they were looking at copper electrodes for this process, they were able to make these 16 different compounds out of CO2, all very valuable in the chemical industry. And the ones I've circled are amongst the top 50, which means that they're getting produced on the order of billions of kilograms per year. And we all know there's 7 billion people on the face of the earth. So you all can do the math. Every man, woman, and child on average across the face of the earth is responsible for one kilogram per year of these molecules being made, which gives you a sense of scale. If we can make these products renewably, we can actually put a dent into the energy problem. So I'll wrap it up there and just end with the conclusion that renewable fuels, I think, is a very promising area. There's lots of ways to attack this. We've been developing catalysts. We've been developing electrodes and electrolyzers and photoelectrodes, trying to understand what's going on with CO2. And of course, I want to thank my wonderful research group. I've been kind of showing them along the way. Uh, and among other uh, agencies, the Global Climate Energy Project for funding a lot of the work that you saw today. So thank you guys for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. What do I think of electric vehicles? I'm a huge fan of electric vehicles, a massive fan of electric vehicles. I think they have a, a tremendous place uh, in society. And the way I look at renewable energy technologies is, is pretty simple. You know, a lot of people want to just naturally like stack things head to head and this versus that and what's going to win. And here's my point. Fossil fuels account for 80% of all energy we consume on Earth. Okay? 80% of what we consume is coming from fossil fuels. 
I do not think there is a single one technology that is just going to replace that 80%. Okay? But I do think that we could come up with, say, a dozen different technologies, 20 different technologies, where if everything's contributing, they're 2%, they're 3%, they're 5%, they're 8%, we can make a, we go a big way towards removing some of the fossil uh, fuels from our network. And I still think fossil fuels will always be important, at least in my lifetime, I think they will be. So I think it's a little bit uh, too aggressive to say we're going to zero out fossil fuels. I don't think we necessarily need to or, or want to. I think they will have their place, but I think all these technologies and batteries are fantastic. And in fact, uh, fuel cell vehicles are, are battery cars. Every fuel cell vehicle that's on the road right now is an electric vehicle. It's a battery vehicle. It's got a battery in it. And really what the fuel cell does is it gives it extra range. For some people, they don't need it. If they're okay driving you know, 80 mile commutes back and forth or 100 miles, that's fine. And that can work wonderfully. What if you're a truck and you want to ship stuff across the country? Uh, it's a different, a different criteria you might go for. Or somebody who drives a lot of long distance within the state of California. You know, every, you know twice a month you're driving to Southern California. Uh, you know, so different, you know, it's a different market. And we don't want just one thing, we want a selection of possibilities. So I think electric vehicles are, are very important in all of that. And I think fuels will be too. So let's go here and then we'll go over here. Yes, sir. What kind of efficiency? So uh, I'd say the by the minimum thermodynamic efficiencies for hydrogen, we're probably, um, I'd say, around 60 to 70 to 80% efficient in those chemical transformations. Efficiency is always a tricky number because it's very related to uh, your reaction rate. Uh, on the CO2, it's more like 40%. If you want to get really high reaction rates, uh, it's, that's, and that's part of the challenge. That's why CO2, you, we just, we're really far away from good catalysts. If you made perfect catalysts, just wonderfully, just couldn't ask for anything more, then we would be in the 80 to 90% uh, efficiency range. And I think once you're there, then you're good to go. Yes, sir. So I'll repeat the question. What kind of temperature pressure conditions are we using for these reactions? Everything I've shown you today is ambient temperature, ambient pressure. However, I think there's a lot, of, lot to be gained. It doesn't mean you have to run at those conditions. There's a, lot of, oops, there's a lot of advantages to running at slightly elevated temperatures or slightly elevated pressures, and there's nothing that says that you shouldn't. So, you know, if you, I think if you're running at several hundred degrees C, that's a different story. But 80 degrees C, for instance, or even 60 degrees C, there could be huge gains. And in fact, a lot of these devices will intrinsically run at these elevated temperatures because they're not perfect. And where does that waste energy go? If it's only 70% efficient, what's going to the other 30% is heat. So it kind of self-heats in the process, which actually, as we all know, generally improves the kinetics of reactions. We got time for one more question. I think this gentleman in front had his hand up first. That's a wonderful question. So uh, I'm gonna zoom up. And the question was in, refer in reference to the two reaction mechanisms that I had presented for the hydrogen evolution reaction. And the question is, should those two mechanisms involve two different rate laws? And the answer is absolutely. The answer is absolutely. So the tricky thing about, uh, the reason what makes it really challenging to know what the reaction actually is uh, and what mechanism it is, so they follow different rate laws, so they should follow different temperature dependencies or different pH dependencies and whatnot. One of the big challenges is that in, in our world, you know, experimentally, you know, this is a PowerPoint drawing of a surface. And it's a beautiful drawing of a surface, nice and flat and ordered. In real life, it's really hard to make electrodes that are so flat and so ordered, and even single crystals that you can buy or make yourself will have defects. And then those defects participate in the reaction as well. And so what you're really looking at is a superposition of sites that are all behaving a little bit differently. And that's why the materials, like real materials that you make, don't follow the rate laws that one draws up using paper and pencil theory. And that's part of what makes it so challenging. That's an excellent, uh, deep and fundamental question. All right, so with that, uh, yeah, thank you all very much for your time and, and great to be here, thank you.